In the previous video, I discussed the role of the reduction in phenomenology, its variations in Husserl and Heidegger, as understood by Jean-Luc Marion, and how the reduction is held as the primary method for achieving givenness. We now turn to the description of givenness in its varying degrees. If you enjoy this video, please consider subscribing to my channel. As always, questions and comments are welcomed. The phenomenon is what shows itself to the extent it gives itself. The more rigorous the reduction, the more givenness is uncovered. Now, let us add that the more givenness uncovered, the more that givenness may be converted into manifestation, leading to a third principle, so much givenness, so much manifestation. To understand this principle, we need to address how givenness varies in the manners of showing itself and degrees of giving itself. These varying levels of adequation or inadequation between concept and intuition or between phenomenon and givenness produce a discontinuous strata of phenomena. In being given, we are presented with three classes, poor phenomena, common law phenomena, and saturated phenomena. This schema appears to be reduced to two classes in negative certainties, that being objects which seem to combine some features of poor and common law phenomena, and then ev events which remain saturated. It should be noted that this is a point of debate in the secondary literature concerning the meaning of and distinction between these strata, whether they are truly discontinuous or emit to numerous gradations. Questions are also raised concerning the passage between these types of phenomena, whether the phenomenon itself determines its own degrees, the receiver determines these degrees in its willingness and capacity to receive the given, or some kind of hermeneutical dialectic between the two. Marion has attempted to settle the matter by arguing that it is necessary to admit the gradualness of saturation, and that between objectness and saturation, the crossings never cease. I'll return to this question in the concluding section of this chapter. For now, let us first sketch the three classes as described in being given. Poor phenomena entail an absence of intuition in the presence of a concept. Notably, these cases have been held up as models for knowledge due to the degree of certainty they yield, as found in categorical intuitions of logic and formal intuitions of mathematics. Such phenomena are never individualized or temporalized. Instead, they remain empty abstractions devoid of content. They give very little in arriving to me, and so manifest almost nothing. Common law phenomena entail an approximate adequation between concept and intuition, as demonstrated by technical and scientific objects. Though not directly linked to the term, habitual phenomena seem to reside here as they are exemplified by technological objects that demand a particular skill. Scientific objects are another example. Science blends conceptual maximums with intuitive minimums seeking the closest possible conformity between theory and measurable data. It does this through a methodological standardization that eliminates what does not allow for adequation. The given phenomenon is induced by the scientific gaze, which allows just enough givenness to come upon me so the phenomenon may manifest, but only to the degree that it can still be measured, predicted, and reproduced. The limiting of phenomena to the horizon of objectivity enters another level of abstraction when the measure of these objects is no longer defined in terms of their functionality or craftsmanship, but in terms of their profitability, leading to the endless reproduction of useless manufactured merchandise divorced from any intrinsic purpose and modes of production. One may consider this a kind of redoubled alienation of the phenomenon. First, in removing from it what does not conform to the measure and functionality of an object. Second, in subsuming the object's instrumentality and modes of production under the horizon of economic profitability. A third possibility entails a situation where so much givenness imposes itself upon me that what manifests exceeds any capacity for conceptualization, prediction, or control. These are saturated phenomena, which deliver one of two kinds of excess. First, there is a pure givenness that exceeds phenomenality altogether. Death exemplifies such an occasion as it gives itself in a manner that necessarily can never show itself. 
not in the other except only as a passage and not in its very arrival, and especially not in oneself who would no longer exist the moment it arrives. One may add the gaze of the other as another case of intuitional deficit, delivering instead the excess of a counter-intentionality through the emptiness of the pupil of the eye. These phenomena, despite never showing themselves directly, continue to deliver an immense effect through a sort of secondary reverberation. As mentioned previously, death delivers anxiety, possibility, infinitude, and the counterintentionality of the gaze, as we'll later see, confers upon me my very identity. Second, there's a perfect givenness whereby intuition exceeds intentionality or concept. These phenomena often do not show themselves to a receiving consciousness either, but this time due to the phenomenon directly showing itself in too much intuition. If death is exemplary of the first kind of excess, birth may be considered exemplary of the latter kind. It's the originary event that makes possible every other phenomenon received. It delivers to me my time and space. It endlessly unfolds up to the point it meets the event of my death, and even then, the effect of birth continues to unfold, but perhaps not in ways I'll ever be present to. Though I'm not present to my own birth, I am a witness to its effects, not as a secondary reverberation, but as a direct unfolding of that event in and as my life. Saturated phenomena resist the limits and conditions set before them. And as such, they're named paradoxes for running counter to our expectations and beliefs. Saturated phenomena, despite how they sound, are no rare accomplishment, but display a certain banality in their ubiquitous happenings. They are even upheld as the new standard for phenomenality itself, inverting the paradigm of metaphysics that place poor phenomena in that role. Marion offers the event idol, flesh, and icon as exemplary cases of saturated phenomena, framed in part by how they exceed the conditions of the understanding set forth by Kant. These four cases of saturated phenomena will be developed in later chapters as they relate to four parallel cases of the thanatonic phenomenon. I'll leave them aside for the moment, and instead I'll address how the four categories of the understanding are subverted by them. First, saturated phenomena may be incommensurable according to quantity, and uh, such as extensive magnitude. They are without precedent, can't be readily divided or aggregated, and contain an infinite number of facets that unfold well after the initial arrival of the phenomenon. This is exemplified by the event. Second, a saturated phenomenon can be unbearable by delivering a blinding intuition that exceeds the measure of any intensive magnitude or the quality. It's difficult to see not due to a lack, but due to an excess of visibility. This is exemplified by paintings and what Marion will more broadly name the idol. Third, they may be unconditioned by any horizon set forth by the category of relation. They can't be placed in a chain of causal interactions as they are unforeseeable, incomprehensible, and unrepeatable. This is exemplified by the auto-affection of the flesh. Fourth, and finally, they may be impossible according to modality. Rather than overwhelm the eyes with an unbearable intensity, they deliver a counter-intentionality that exceeds my gaze, exemplified by the icon of the face. We have to keep in mind that these saturated phenomena are variations of a more general givenness, and so become intelligible only when considered within the general framework of the given and its determinations. Indeed, we can see that the four cases of the saturated phenomenon are each linked to a particular determination of the given. This is not to suggest that they exclude the other determinations, but that they display a particular intensive variant of at least one of those determinations. The painting is marked by the intensity of its arrival. The event is encountered in the mode of an excessive facticity. The flesh is eminently exposed, giving rise to the incident of lived experience. The face demands the most radical kind of anamorphosis to the point of transforming subjectivity in its accommodation to the phenomenon. Whereas the excesses over quantity, quality, relation to center our horizons through incommensurability, unbearability, and unconditionality respectively, the excess of modality delivers an impossibility that decenters the subject itself, 
who finds itself arising from the phenomenon rather than initiating it. This in turn directs our attention more generally to the one who encounters and receives the given. In the search for a grounded certainty, the figure of the subject has been conferred a philosophical priority, providing conditions of possibility for experience. In contrast, we have found that phenomena give themselves and, in giving themselves, take the initiative in showing themselves. With saturated phenomena, this showing, if one can even be ascribed, delivers itself as a call that precedes and evokes a receiver. Such a call is distinguished from the one proposed by Heidegger in relation to the question of being. For the early Heidegger, the call derives from the conscience, summoning Dasein to itself. It directs Dasein to a primordial guilt and responsibility for its own existence and to resolutely project itself toward its own most possibilities. In the later Heidegger, the call becomes the call of being itself, the Einspruch des Eins, which is delivered through Ereignis. In contrast to Heidegger's formulations, the call emerging from saturated phenomena arrives on their own accord. It's a pure call, unconditioned by any preceding or superseding horizon, even that of being itself. Such a call characterizes every saturated phenomenon as it summons an infinite hermeneutics in the case of the event, calls for the need of reviewing for the painting, summons in the flesh as auto-affection, and most notably calls us through a counter-intentionality in the face. The accomplishment of the call, then, is in its being directed at the one who receives it delivering to the receiver its individuation through the facticity of the phenomenon's arrival, but also in assigning a vocation that comes to singularly define the receiver, who is now conferred with an infinite responsibility to convert the call into manifestation. In receiving the call delivered by saturated phenomena, one receives not merely the phenomena, but receives themselves. The original receiver who receives objects and beings is now converted into la donne, the gifted, upon receiving the call. The gifted is defined as what receives itself entirely from what it receives. Consequently, it renounces any authority to determine the meaning of this call in advance as the convocation takes one by surprise in arriving as an event from elsewhere. The gifted emerges out of this original delay which denies it the possibility of ever bringing the call into full presence, and thus the impossibility of arriving at any definitive identity of a caller behind the call. Like Dasein, who is the being for whom being is a question, the gifted is the given for whom givenness may achieve manifestation. Some notable departures are made from Dasein, however. Authentic Dasein accomplishes itself through an ecstatic anticipatory resoluteness toward its own most possibilities. It seeks to bypass the individuation of particular beings to arrive at the indistinct generality of being itself. This bypassing of beings entails its own loss of individuation as Dasein becomes both everyone and no one at the same time. This is the point I recognize has been disputed in the secondary literature. The gifted, by contrast, is accomplished in receiving what is fundamentally other than itself. It's born out of an originary inauthenticity and carries the mark of this elsewhere with it. The gifted locates the givenness in the given not by bypassing the individuality of the given, but through it. The given is not a particular expression of a general category, but is defined by its singular, unpredictable, and unrepeatable arrival. In receiving the individuated phenomenon, the gifted itself becomes individuated and achieves its unsubstitutable singularity. Now, perhaps one of the most debated and certainly one of the most misunderstood aspects of this phenomenology is the role of the receiver in relation to the given. This debate often circles around the issue of whether this self is rendered overly passive, conferring too much initiative to the phenomenon, and failing to recognize the role of a fundamental hermeneutics. This debate is understandable given, until more recently, a lack of explicit elaboration was provided in, tar- in terms of the relationship between hermeneutics and givenness. However, it's also often based on a misunderstanding of this phenomenology, a failing to demonstrate inadequate appreciation for the distinction made between giving and showing, and an inordinate emphasis on saturated phenomena 
to the neglect of the determinations of the given. I'll return to this in the final video of this section. Now, in the concluding chapter of being given, a final task is considered, but not yet developed. It concerns how to describe the situation in which one gifted encounters another gifted. This crossing of gifted is named here intergivenness, which is put into contrast with intersubjectivity and interobjectivity. It denotes the most advanced development and perhaps completion of phenomenality. Here, one reaches the other in their unsubstitutable particularity through love. The book, uh, The Erotic Phenomenon, which comes out a few years later after being given, will establish the logic of such a situation. And it's to the erotic phenomenon we'll turn in our next video. Thank you for watching to the end, and uh, I welcome again any comments, questions. Uh, please subscribe to be notified when the next video is released, and I look forward to seeing you next time.